My internet connection is unstable. Great. All right. So, uh, good evening and welcome to Virtual Friday's Dire Literary Series. And tonight, I'm very, very excited to uh, host our feature, uh, Gregory Orr. And uh, if you really want to find out about, about Gregory, you can visit his website. I think most people kind of know who he is, but here is his website, and it is Gregory or.net and you can find out all about him and uh or you know the beauty of the modern day internet encyclopedia is you can find out about him with the uh link that says find out about him and uh you know here you'll find all of his accomplishments a little bit of story about his life and you can also see all the the books that he has written um so with that um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Orr, and uh, I look forward to it. So take it away. Mr. Orr here. Yeah, okay. What I'm going to do is um, read poems from this book that will come out this summer from Copper Canyon. It's called uh, Selected Books of the Beloved. And uh, what it is is collection of lyric poems they're all um, they're all related to a set of themes they're short simple lyrics recurring themes uh, and terms uh, beloved love and loss renewal uh, so on and so forth uh, none of the poems has any has a title uh, it's uh, and so I'll just pause between them and read as many as I can in the time given me and off we go. I'll start, you know, in this theme of the beloved, I'll start with the meeting, we'll move through loss toward some kind of um, resurrection for me through through poems, through song. Okay. Even before speech revealed your secret, there was looking. Even before song that gave you away, there was gazing. The beloved felt your eyes upon her. He dimly understood why you looked at him that way. Speech of the eyes, the stare and the glimpse, the glance that lingers. So who will give first and who will give most? My bold phrasing pleases me. I think it proves I'm in charge and can sharply bargain over what parts I still control. To my surprise, he simply insists I hold nothing back. Her only request, I surrender all I possess. Hoarding your joys and despairs as if they were clothes you bought but never wore. Look at this bright shirt, a possibility you glimpsed but feared to seize. The beloved is waiting. You have a date. Put on that shirt before it fades. With your embrace, you chose each other, which is to choose death and all that comes before it. Sufferings and joys 
and infinite unintended harms. Large choice for such small arms. For such a journey, maps are useless. Physical distance, the least of it. Between one heart and another, a short road and a long path. Getting lost, what's wrong with that? Hold off rain. Of course, my garden craves water. But the peonies are in full blossom. If you fall now, their petals will all be scattered. Wait a day. Let them feel the pure joy of opening. Fall tomorrow, then you can show them. Love is also a shattering. In the Navajo origin story, it began with weeping and became a song. One of us was lost. That's how it started. It began as weeping and turned into song. And according to the Maori, there's a way of grieving in which a person's tears are matched like rhymed couplets in the West and words emerge from these paired tears or merge with them. They call it weeping with meaning. It's something only humans do. When the coffin was closed and the lid screwed down, when it was fed into the furnace and flames consumed it, your eyes were useless. What tears could put out that fire? And so you shut them, let the lids of your eyes close over the beloved's body. For a while now, darkness and what you see will be inside you. I put the beloved in a wooden coffin. The fire ate his body. The flames devoured her. I put the beloved in a poem or song, tucked it between two pages of the book. How bright the flames, all of me burning all of me on fire and still whole. Sorrow makes children of us all, Emerson wrote when his young son died. The wisest knows nothing. And grown Tennyson became a child crying in the night, a child crying for the light and with no language but a cry. Words written by those who were lost, given to us, paths in the dark. Now the snow is falling even more than an hour ago. 
the pine in the backyard bows with the weight of it. Two years ago, my father died. What love we had hidden under misery, weighed down with years of silence. And now maybe the poem can free us. Maybe the poem can express the love and let the rest slide to the earth as the snow does now, freeing the tree of its burden. If deepest grief is hell, when the animal self wants to lie down in the dark and die also. If deepest grief is hell, then the world returning, not soon, not easily, must be heaven. The joke you laughed at must be heaven. Or the funny thing the cat did at its food dish. Whatever guides you back to the world, that dark so deep the tiniest light will do. Flipping pages randomly or assiduously reading front to back. As the religious search scriptures for the apt text, the exact passage that addresses their suffering or confusion. So I search through books of poems. When I find the right one, I'll know. Disturbed and made easeful in the same moment. Hurt more deeply by the blade that heals. The world comes into the poem the poem comes into the world. Reciprocity, it all comes down to that. As with lovers, when it's right, you can't say who is kissing whom. How lucky we are that you can't sell a poem, that it has no value. Might as well give it away. That poem you love, that saved your life, wasn't it given to you? River, inside the river, world within the world. All we have is words to reveal the rose, the rose obscures. That song on the jukebox, an emissary, the beloved saint. It's only doing its two part job. First, it breaks our heart. Then it promises never to mend it again. three more. 
more stores being built on the corner, more things to buy and sell. The beloved is lost. She can't be bought. He can't be sold. For the price of a poem, the beloved is yours again. If you can't afford that, write one of your own. Loss and loss and more loss. That's what the sea teaches. The need to stay nimble against the suck of receding waves, the sand disappearing under our feet. Here where sea meets shore, the best of dancing floors. Last one. This is what was bequeathed us, this earth the beloved left and leaving left to us. No other world but this one, willows and the river and the factory with its black smokestacks. No other shore, only this bank on which the living gather. No meaning but what we find here. No purpose but what we make. That and the beloved's clear instructions turn me into song, sing me awake. Done. Thank you, Gregory. That was really, really, um, that was really moving, incredible work. The book is, uh, the selected books of the beloved is the name of that book. And you said that there are no titles to any of these poems. Um, my question about that is, did it, was that the original idea, the original start, or did you have, uh, you know, you, you had a few and then you bound them together. A, titling poems is, is a hard, right? I mean, I, for me it is, I hate it, I hate it. So we could start there. There are 530 poems. I mean, come on, you got 530 titles you could give me? Poem number one, poem number two. I mean, what? Couldn't do it. Also, they just didn't happen that way. It wasn't, it was, I was hearing phrases, I was hearing words, I was hearing some something that wanted to, to say itself, but I, I didn't have any sense that I was, uh, I was following a voice more than I was writing poems. And I mean, I'm perfectly willing to, title poems somewhat if it's you know if they say well that's your job you better do it and they rise you're fucking up i'll do it but they couldn't do it with these it just didn't come that way so luckily the publisher put uh, a uh, index of uh, first lines at the back of the book you know I just have to hope people will, if they're looking for something, they'll remember the first line. I don't know. There it is. Yeah, um, I got a question hey, coming. <laughs> I got a question coming in from Dick, and maybe Dick can type fast and help me out here because there's a word that I don't quite get in the question. But Dick asks, could you talk more about the beloved and how several, and that's the word I need to know. Ours Poetica move together in and out of this reading. Uh, yeah, yeah. The Beloved for me is, um, it's a, 
a mortal uh, creature who, you know, to who, whom in that relationship to the beloved meaning, meaning happens. I mean, uh, and there are multi, one has multiple beloveds, if I hope, certainly my beagle foxhound mutt is one of my beloveds, for example. Uh, it seems to me beloveds, as what I understand of it, as it's been sort of showing itself to me, is, is beloveds are, are people, um, creatures. They could be places. Certainly there are beloved places that are beloved. There's something where you're in a relationship and you give it, give love and you're getting some love back. And I don't know what else to say about that. It's not, um, it is not, um, their beloved is mortal. I mean, that part of the story for me is beloveds. You can lose beloveds. In fact, you will. Um, that's part of our human story, which is why we have poems and songs, it seems to me, to try to resurrect the beloved. But these are, there's nothing, the beloved, for instance, beloved is not capitalized. I wouldn't, the book is capitalized in the thing because it's this gigantic anthology of poems and songs. So that's capitalized. It's not a religious text. It's totally secular text. Totally secular experience, but it just, that's the way it wanted to talk about itself to me. Does it make any sense? Well, who cares? Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, what I we found interesting when you, were, when you were reading um, the narrative poems that are connected. By changing the order, you almost create this whole new like meta poem within the poem. Now, was that intentional at all? That would have to be a guess. Yeah, there's some kind, there's a whole meta, meta mythic thing going on. Um, you know, it happens for the reader or it doesn't. I don't know what to say. I mean, it, I want it to be there. I hope it's there. Um, I have some kind of faith that it's there, but there you go. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, there's a very incantatory, repetitious thing. And that's either going to be part of the story or it's going to drive you crazy or both. We got a question. We got a question. Part of, oh, part of the way. Excuse me for that. Um, I got a question for Richard by Richard and it ends with the compliment. So I'll start with the compliment because the question will flow better. Your work is heartbreakingly beautiful is the compliment. And he asks, how would you characterize your spirituality? My UU minister has used the last poem you read in our worship. Um, yeah. Well, that happens uh, that, that the, the work is, the poems, these poems have been taken as being useful in certain you know, context. Um, I'm not, I mean, for me, the beloved is mortal, dies and must be resurrected if we're to go on living a loved life. Um, the book that I talk about is this just gigantic anthology of lyric poems and rock and roll uh, that helps us live. Uh, it's not, if it can be adapted by somebody into a religious context, God bless or whatever. I mean, sorry about the God bless, but I mean, you know, I mean, go for it. <laughs> That's what I meant, go for it. I didn't say God bless, I said, go for it. I mean, I, I, you know, we'd have to go into my personal history to say why religion is not a story for me, not a credible story. Spirituality, whatever that might mean, what the heck, yeah. You were talking about, you know, uh, narrative poems and rock and roll throughout this book. Which came first, your love of poetry or your love for rock and roll? 
oh, come on, you know, I'm an American. How can you, you know, I lived in a town with a hundred people, but it had a jukebox. One, one drugstore, one jukebox, come on. Your jukebox is where your soul is stored when you're a kid. Um, poetry came later, not, you know, it came before I left high school got, and I'm so glad thanks to one wonderful teacher there. But, but you know, I mean, hey, rock and roll, what, which means everything in the way of popular song, it, it's, it's, it's lyric poetry. The Nobel Prize Committee settled that for us by giving it to Dylan, right? End of, end of discussion. Anybody who's still confused about that should talk to the Swedes. <laughs> I think it's the Swedes, right? You know, I mean, it's, it's what brings us alive inside, emotionally. That's what poetry is supposed to do. That's what popular music does. How could yeah, we a, live through adolescence without, how could we live through adolescence without popular music, rock and roll, right? What, whatever. So there it is. Your emotional, spiritual life is totally entangled with language and poetry. One interview I saw, you described a life, lifelong love of poetry. So which poem was your first love? You mean that I heard? So remember the one that really hooked you, yeah. Wow, that's a good question. I won't lie. Um, the first way poetry was introduced to me was as an expressive possibility for me as a human being. In other words, that I could write something and that this wonderful teacher would say, well, that's a poem. I mean, it wasn't, it was a pretty crummy poem, but she was saying, yes. So, so the first thing for me was the expressive, you know, that release, that excitement, that mystery of that. And then, you know, cause I was as egotistical, miserable adolescence. So, so the expression, the release was more exciting first. Then I began to realize, oh, wait a minute, there, there are poems in the world. I think, uh, I think poems by Dylan Thomas and early Yeats were my first loves as a like, you know, 18 year old. The early Yeats where he's feeling sorry for himself enormously. That's good for adolescence. <laughs> that you there's can relate a, to. There's a theme that you have I about do. poetry as poetry being a stabilizing force through grief. Now, when you write through grief, um, do you do it for catharsis or does the catharsis just come from the writing in general? I think catharsis, but also transformation. I mean, the thing is that grief turned into a poem is not grief anymore. Grief is wordless and crying and misery and despair. A poem of grief is that phenomena transformed into language and it becomes an affirmation because all poems have the energy of affirmation just in the very fact of rhythm, the fact of, of uh, articulation. So, so uh, grief in a poem, poem of grief is not grief. Grief is grief. A poem of grief is the raw material of grief transformed into something else. Now it may still be uh, an articulation or dramatization of despair, but I would say, yeah, even so, it's not, that isn't despair. Despair is wordless, horrible. Words are what save us, you know. 
I mean, all we have is words to reveal the rose that the rose obscures. There's something that's got to, you know, we've been given this amazing mysterious gift of language. And I think it's not just to name things. I think it's also to change things. You've uh, it changed me. Yeah, you've had your own uh, recovery and transformation from tragedy. And it, another interview I read it said it changed and influenced your ideas about trauma, silence, and poetry. Now, I understand the trauma and the poetry influence. How did it influence the silence? Oh, gosh, I don't know about that. I mean, making it really short, it's like, uh, you know, the, the trauma in my life, uh, you know, I was in a hunting, it, grew up in the country. When I was 12 years old, I killed my younger brother in a hunting accident. And uh, uh, about two years after that, my mother died overnight. So I was, I felt responsible for that for non-rational reasons. Everybody responded to that, those events with silence. And so between trauma and silence, or I associate trauma with silencing, um, you know, you're looking for, you're looking at a dead end life. Um, what to me was redemptive was language was something that broke silence. Uh, and broke the shame and despair. Um, and uh, gosh, I'm lost. <laughs> Let questions, answers over there. <laughs> but silence is, is I, I, mean, I, I suppose there are positive silences. Absolutely must be. I mean, but but then there's also this social silencing of horror and despair and trauma and loss of the ability to articulate. And, and I guess that's part of what I've set my writing and thinking about poetry against because poetry freed me from that. Well, here's a little validation. Isolation, despair, and silence. Yeah, here's a little validation about what you just said. And I don't even know if you have ever uh, intentionally heard or intentionally felt this or heard this. But when I said that you were going to be my guest tonight, people said that how inspired they were by your work. And, it, and someone even said your poems saved their life. So, you know, how do you feel about having that much weight in, in the world? And that's a terrible question. Feel free to skip that one if you'd like. <laughs> and if it's a question we can't answer. We don't know what that question even means, let alone how to answer it. Uh, you know, what? I mean, I'm... <sighs> I'm deeply touched that that anything I write or have written could help somebody. Certainly, I would not be alive without poetry. And so somebody gave me these huge gifts. Uh, and you know, it's just part of that story. You you I all of us as poets have received enormous gifts of spiritual affirmation from poetry. And I don't mean that religiously, but just psychologically, wherever we, metaphysically, wherever we want, however you want to put it, we've all received that gift. And then we, we, we you know, if we're poets, we pray that we'll be able to, to, to add to it, to be able to add our own story and our own perceptions. And then, you know, it's, just part of that incredible, I mean, you know, like I quote in some of the poems I was quoting, I'm, you know, I'm quoting Emerson and the Maori and uh, Tennyson of all people. Uh, 
you know, it's like, it's all, that's to me, that's all part of the book. That's all part of this huge human uh, heritage we've got that's saying to us, hey, wake the fuck up. This is what life is about. Love, suffering, despair, death, uh, renewal. And, and it's all there. That's what poetry is all about. It's, it's there in this book to tell us, you know, guess what? We've been there. You know, Sappho saying this, guess what? I've been there. You're passionately in love. You don't know fucking anything about it. You should know what I felt. Oh, here, I'll tell you what I felt. And there it is, you know? And it's like, whoa, that's so crazy. And here's this Chinese poet, you know, Du Fu telling us what it's like when war has come to his town and everything is being destroyed. And he says, only mountains and rivers remain. Everything's been destroyed, only mountains. Are... God damn, I mean, that's, you know, if you're in the Ukraine now, you know, if you could see anything that's surviving, you might say only, only mountains and rivers. I mean, you know, it's just, it's, it's, we've been, we've got this stuff and it's there for us. It doesn't change anything except that it inspirits us makes it possible to go on. Okay, let's go back into the big board here. There's a question from St. James. Uh, did Ron, Rod McEwen influence your work at all? Not that I know of. <laughs> okay, another question from Tara. Or, don't know. Your friend Rod McEwen's or was he, was that a put down? No, I think it just was a straight, straight question. There you go. Um, straight Tara answer. says, nope. talk about desire. You now desire in so many different ways in the book. How were you able to wind it so well, spiral it, if you will, throughout? Thank you. I don't know. <laughs> Good question. No answer. All right, last question. Last right, question. Too, right? um, it's okay to not have yeah. your 2019 book was, was titled The Last Love Poem I'll Ever Write. Did you ever write any more? Of course. Poets are liars. <laughs> Check with Plato. Yeah, no. Of course. It was, it, but it seemed like a good title, didn't it? Yeah, it's a great I, title. I thought it was a good title at the time. Of course, God, if I'd never wrote another book. Oh, man, it would be horrible. All right, well, Gregory, thank I you mean, so much. That um, would be to be. My pleasure. And listen, thank you so much. Uh, this has been fun. And uh, excuse me for cutting you off. My apologies. But here yeah. is here is a look at his book oh. that's coming oh. out soon. The selected poems of the selected books of the beloved, and he read from Gregory read from that tonight, and it was wonderful. And some of his other books, the blessing, a memoir, you can find all the last love poem I will ever write, and the primer for poets and readers of poetry, which is a wonderful book that uh, I just saw recently on somebody's uh, coffee table. So um, check it out. Um, Gregory, thank you so much for coming here and uh, reading and answering so many questions. My pleasure, thank you. It's fun. It was lots of fun. Night. <laughs>